forgot about your new recent, you know, recent work, but I'm sure the, these guys will have questions about yeah. uh, uh, the bad norm. So yeah. feel free to, to ask questions. This is, I think, it's a very focused group. All of these guys are working on problems very similar to this from different angles. So feel free to interrupt and ask questions. This will be a very exciting talk. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Viti uh, and Yu, uh, for the uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, so I am Mia Shang, and I came from uh, the Department of Computer Science at Purdue University. Uh, and uh, before that, I came from uh, in Cornell University, and uh, we had uh, you know, collaborations uh, with uh, you know, Viping and uh, you know, my advisor uh, on computational sustainability and for also for AI-driven scientific discovery. Uh, so uh, it's a wonderful opportunity, and I'm very uh, happy to be here, um, uh, you know, to, to see uh, all these guys and uh, all you guys and I see this really exciting opportunity for this, uh, you know, exist, uh, you know, the AI uh, Institute uh, that we are going to use artificial intelligence to address uh, very important problems uh, facing our planet uh, nowadays. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, a, actually a summarization of my work uh, that I have been in Purdue for five years. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is basically summarized, you know, uh, you know, my work uh, at, uh, at Purdue. Uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, I came from the Department of Computer Science at Purdue, uh, and it's just your neighbor. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about vertical reasoning, uh, enhanced learning generation and scientific discovery. Uh, so let me get started. So uh, machine learning and automatic reasoning are two fundamental pillars of artificial intelligence. Uh, so machine learning uh, is a bottom-up approach uh, which means that we learn, uh, you know, these predictive models from uh, data. Uh, so this is also called inductive reason. Okay. Uh, now uh, it is actually uh, challenging to provide formal guarantees for machine learning models, uh, and so the learning models may violate constraints, uh, especially in real and unseen situations. Uh, automatic reasoning, on the other hand, uh, includes, uh, you know, constraint satisfaction, uh, constraint programming, satisfiability, and so on. Uh, these are another important pillar of artificial intelligence, uh, and these are top-down approaches, which means you first reviewed uh, problem formulations, uh, and uh, you know this often leads to rigid models. Uh, that's because you know the problem formulation need to be uh, uh, you know uh, agreed a priori before you solve the problem, uh, and these kind of approaches are difficult uh, to adapt to if you have changing data distributions. Uh, so uh, this is also my research, uh, but I believe uh, the fundamental, the grand challenge uh, of AI, uh, of, of next generation AI, is in the integration of automatic reasoning and machine learning. Uh, and why do I say so? Uh, is, uh, you know, I use a small example. So this is an example of a indoor uh, scene design. So, uh, so imagine you have a kitchen remodel, okay? Uh, you have this uh, uh, existing kitchen, okay? Uh, and uh, you have these uh, specifications. Uh, you know, the user gives you these specifications of adding a blue microwave right off the oven uh, and add a green toaster left off the oven and below the sink. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, now, to accomplish this task, uh, you first uh, actually need uh, you know system one perception, uh, and uh, you know I'm basically using the word of this uh, this book of thinking fast and slow. Uh, this very famous book. Uh, so uh, the system one perception is, uh, you know, roughly known as the, you know, the fastest thinking system of our cognitive system. Uh, you basically need this fast thinking to actually locate. So this is adding a blue microwave right off the oven, right? So so you actually need to, uh, you know, reason about knowing, uh, you know, where is this are these existing objects, okay? Uh, but this itself does not complete the task. Uh, this perception does not complete the task. Uh, it actually needs a, a second uh, stage, planning and generation. Uh, you basically need to reason about, uh, you know, these objects to be generated. So, for example, in this case, uh, is the microwave uh, and the toasters uh, in relation uh, to the, uh, you know, these existing uh, objects, the sink and uh, the oven. Okay. Uh, so this actually needs a little bit of planning. Okay, standard planning uh, and generation uh, into the process. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you look at it, uh, the first step is mostly a perception step. So this can be solved by, uh, you know, uh, machine learning. Uh, but the second step is a, you, you actually need an integration uh, of learning and reasoning to accomplish this task. 
Okay. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, you know, a uh, well, complete uh, constraint reasoning approach uh, solve this task. Uh, it is actually very difficult. Uh, so the reason being that, uh, you know, you actually have this existing kitchen environment. Okay. Uh, and uh, it, it contains very rich visual information. Uh, and it's actually very difficult to encode uh, this kind of visual information uh, into objective functions, constraints, and so on. Uh, so, so because of that, uh, you know, uh, this the complete constraint reasoning approach is very difficult to solve this problem. Okay? Uh, now, will a complete machine learning approach uh, solve this problem? Uh, so this is actually uh, you know, generated uh, by stable diffusion, which is one of the Popular, very popular, uh, highly popular uh, model uh, in the field, especially uh, make a lot of noise, uh, you know, last year. Um, so, uh, so, so when this steward fusion, you know, you fit it with this existing kitchen image uh, and these specifications. Uh, so basically what it generates uh, is this very busy kitchen, okay? Uh, so it has a lot of components in it, basically alter the entire thing. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it does not satisfy the user specifications, okay? Uh, so this is actually generated by our algorithm. So you will see the algorithm in a moment. Uh, it's actually an integrated, uh, uh, you know, uh, reasoning and learning approach. Uh, and our algorithm has, uh, you know, makes minimal modifications uh, to the existing thing, okay? Uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, we put these objects uh, in this correct location that satisfy these specifications, okay? Uh, and at the same time, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the objects are placed in their reasonable location. What do I mean by that is, uh, you know, for example, this toaster uh, is placed on the tabletop, uh, which is, you know, the usual place where a toaster should be placed on. Uh, it's not, you know, in a, in a floor or hanging in the air or, you know, in, in you know, these uh, you know, unreasonable locations. Just Very good. Question, like this, uh, generation was 3D render. Uh, this is uh, currently we are working on a. Uh, that's a very good question. Currently we are working on a 2D image. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, given a 2D image, uh, and the the specifications are stated in uh, you know in propositional logic. So this is the current model, uh, and we generate another uh, 2D image. Okay, uh, that has these uh, you know these objects uh, rendered in these uh, locations in two D. Okay, uh, but I uh, you know fully agree with you uh, that uh, uh, you know recently we have been working on a three D model that uh, you know in the first step we are actually going to estimate the three D uh, uh, model of this thing and then actually put uh, these appliances in the three D environment. Uh, and then make a 2D image out of the 3D environment. Uh, and the results are even better. Uh, we are still, this is our preliminary work, we are still working on it. Um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I can show you a few images after this talk, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are still in the process of writing it up and so on, okay? So, go ahead. So, when, when it took the context input specification below the sink, because it's 2D image, is that why the uh, yeah, green yeah, toaster yeah, is yeah. actually below? As yes. A, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. I agree with yeah. you. <laughs> I agree with you that, yeah, you know, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, physically, uh, you know, below, uh, you know, it's uh, because of it's in the propositional logic. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, that's indeed a, one of the uh, limitations of our approach uh, at the moment that we discuss, uh, you know, we work on this. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, we anticipate that this can be, uh, you know, uh, resolved uh, if we reason about this in 3D. So, so in that case, it's not, you know, it's actually put it before this, this thing, right? Um, yeah, so uh, that's very good. Uh, you know, feel free to interrupt me with, if you have additional uh, questions, okay? Uh, so the uh, integrated approach uh, is, uh, has three steps. Uh, the first step is a perceptual module. Uh, so this is really uh, to reason about, you know, existing uh, objects in this image. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, uh, we use a, uh, you know, a neural uh, perception module uh, based on neural networks uh, that uh, is able to, you know, locate these objects in the uh, form of bounding boxes. Uh, but this, uh, you know, was uh, supplemented by the second uh, spatial reasoning module. Uh, and the spatial reasoning module is a, uh, you know, it's a neural and symbolic integrated approach. Uh, we first has this uh, uh, recursive neural net uh, that actually uh, make decisions on, uh, you know, where are these objects to be generated. 
uh, currently is in the form of bounding boxes. Uh, but in the 3D uh, case, we're actually going to reason about some intuitive physics about the shape of these objects and so on. Um, and uh, the decisions made by these uh, recursive neural nets are filtered out uh, through a symbolic approach. And this is a constraint reasoning approach uh, that actually checks uh, if you place these objects in these locations, will these decisions violate uh, user specifications? Uh, if they violate user specifications, uh, we are going to ask the, uh, the recursive neural net to roll back uh, these decisions uh, and uh, you know, make the, uh, uh, the, the decisions otherwise. Uh, and uh, you know, in the end, uh, you know, the, end uh, the decisions made by this uh, integrated approach, uh, we can guarantee that you know, the, the locations generated by these approaches, uh, they satisfy uh, you know, user specification. Okay, uh, now in the third step, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, completed uh, by this uh, visual element generator. This is again a neural based uh, image generator uh, that basically uh, is going to generate uh, these objects uh, in these uh, locations. Okay, uh, and uh, basically, as you can see, uh, again, I want to point out that, you know, we can generate these images uh, satisfying user specifications. Uh, but if you just use a neural based uh, generator model, it's, they are not able to uh, you know, generate the images satisfying user specification. Okay? Uh, so uh, my research in the last five years, uh, you know, I work in a wide variety of domains, uh, you know, ranging from design generation, language generation, AI, human scientific discovery, and so on. A uh, consistent theme of my research is in the uh, uh, integration of automatic reasoning and learning. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm very happy uh, to be here, and today I'm uh, basically going to show you uh, three cases, uh, uh, three uh, cases that, uh, you know, reasoning actually help enhance, uh, you know, neural generation and expert scientific discovery, and at the same time, uh, you know, solves the satisfiability module counting problems uh, that integrates symbolic and statistical AI with promo guarantees. Uh, so that is a quite uh, long introduction. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I don't know if you have questions. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to uh, go to the uh, the second part. Oh, okay, go so ahead. Part. My quick question was: What happens if you have conflicting, uh, essentially, a statement from the, from the user saying keep this to the yes. left, and you don't even have a space on the left uh, to keep something, or two of them are conflicting each other? What are the statements the user is getting? Yes. Uh, so you so said it's symbolic, right? Right. So, yeah. yeah. Right. 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 So in that case, our system will give a, uh, you know, basically return a message saying, you know, it's impossible. Uh, oh, it will generate that. Okay. Yeah, 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 that's what I was asking. Yeah, yeah, got it. yeah. Okay. Another question. Uh -huh. What ahead. if there's a mirror in the image and in the, oh, real, space, here. In the, in the real space? Oh, that's nice. <laughs> it's good to put a object left to the object and in the mirror, it's actually to the right of them. Thank you very much. I, I have never thought about that. Okay. Um, it would be very exciting to test you know, the behavior yeah. of our approach uh, in that setting. Uh, uh, yeah, this I, I have never thought about that. Along uh, the same thing, will it actually clone the image if there is a mirror? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, this yeah. have this. You know, maybe you have two mirrors facing each other, and where you have this, you know, oh, the same it's objects. Uh, what faces, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Inside the mirror, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, a very good question. I haven't tested. I don't know. Uh, maybe it will. I, 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 yeah. You know, it's uh, my prediction is it will break my, our system, uh, but. Uh, very good question. Uh, so, so this actually made me think of, you know, we actually need to reason about the physical properties uh, of these objects already in the image. Uh, very good question, yeah. Um, all right, uh, so the second part of the talk, uh, we are going to talk about using reasoning, automatic reasoning to expedite scientific discovery. And I believe this is, uh, you know, the part of the talk that, you know, uh, many of you are interested. Uh, so uh, over the years, there has been Tremendous progress uh, in deep learning approaches, um, you know, in a lot of different domains. Uh, in science domains, this is also very exciting. So I'm here basically using this upper fold as an uh, example. So this is a neural-based approach uh, that, uh, uh, you know, use uh, AI to actually find uh, the folding structures for proteins. Uh, but I'm still arguing that, uh, uh, you know, human learning or human scientific discovery uh, outperforms AI-based scientific discoveries in a lot of ways. 
so these are uh, famous examples, uh, Isaac Newton, Maxwell, Einstein. Uh, their discoveries are active explorations with purposes, okay? Uh, and uh, they are able to learn from an incredibly small set of surprising or boring examples. Uh, so if you think about Newton, uh, you know, he discovered this law of universal gravity by simply looking at, you know, apples falling from the tree. Uh, so it's quite, you know, boring example, but, uh, you know, the result of that uh, is, uh, you know, very elegant mathematical equations. Uh, you know, the law of universal gravity that can be, uh, you know, applied in almost every corner of our universe, okay? Uh, so uh, I argue that, you know, uh, despite there are tremendous progress made in uh, AI-based approach, uh, we haven't been able to, uh, you know, catch up with, you know, this level of discovery yet. Uh, now, the question is, uh, what can AI learn from human scientists? Okay, uh, so for that, I'm going to use uh, symbolic regression. Uh, this is the task of learning uh, symbolic equations uh, from experimental data as an example. Uh, so this is a very good benchmark for, uh, for scientific discovery. It's really because, uh, you know, if you really think about what Newton is doing, you know, as he is basically, uh, you know, discovered the law of uh, gravity. This is basically, uh, you know, a mathematical equation from experimental data, right? Uh, now, there has been uh, quite a few works uh, in this domain, symbolic regression. Uh, my summarization uh, for this kind of work is most of these works uh, follow the so-called horizontal paths. Okay, now what do I mean by that? Uh, is, let's say, you know, we use this example of, uh, you know, the discovery of the ideal guess law as an example. They often start with a guess of uh, the symbolic equation, okay, the ideal guess law. Uh, especially, uh, you know, often the case, the initial guess is not good, okay? So what they do is they start to change, modify this equation along the way, okay? And here they find a good fit, okay? That fits the data set very well. Uh, now, if you plot the trace uh, of this uh, uh, process, you will see that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the trace of the equation that they discover uh, form this uh, very zigzag road, uh, route in this four hypothesis space involving, uh, you know, all the independent variables, okay? Uh, now, uh, this kind of approach, if you visualize it in this way, then it, they can be quite challenging, uh, especially uh, with this kind of uh, equations with many independent variables. Uh, the reason is really because there are many candidate equations, um, you know, in this four hypothesis space, right? Uh, and therefore, uh, they may be very challenging. Uh, what we propose here uh, is this vertical discovery. Uh, the vertical discovery coincides with uh, the scientific approach, okay? Uh, so what we do, uh, human scientists do, is, uh, you know, we start with uh, simple models, okay? We start by holding all the independent variables as constant, and we only allow two variables to vary. So in this case, the pressure and volume. Okay, and we use very carefully designed, um, you know, uh, controlled variable experiments, uh, and we know that these two variables they are inverse proportional to each other. Okay, uh, and then once we discover this equation, uh, we add another independent variable into the play, uh, and then we discover this new equation that involves three independent variables, uh, and then uh, more independent variables, and so on and so forth. So if you brought a choice uh, of uh, how we discover these equations, it forms this uh, vertical discovery route uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that goes from, uh, you know, small hypothesis spaces to the full hypothesis space, okay? So, so does okay. it depend upon what variables you choose to focus on in the beginning? Yes. Or, or you let it focus on any pair? Uh, so, so, at the, uh, so, so the first uh, uh, iteration of this algorithm is uh, we fix an order. Uh, uh, of this so you know that P and B would be fixed. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, we fix it. But could you just simply say, choose all pairs first? I, 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 uh, we tried that, and that has uh, an uh, order of magnitude increase, uh, a better in quality of the equations discovered. So we okay. let many different uh, schedules, many different, uh, you know, hypotheses compete with each other. That led to, uh, uh, you know, the increase. Uh, I see. Uh, I see. In the, in the, in the and I'm assuming the you are trying to discover these equations mm -hmm. as a match to the data. 
Yes. Right? Yes. Now the data can be noisy. Right? Yes. Even even the yes. the uh, yeah. Newton of yeah, course I... saw that it yeah. sort of fits the observations made by yeah. people hundreds yeah, of yeah. years before, yeah. right? But depending on how noisy the data is and how many choices yeah. you have, you could yeah. fit something by accident. Right. So is that something that you investigate? That is, we, we are currently investigating the data. Yeah. How much knowledge do you need to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are currently investigating uh, this kind of behavior, and I really like. Uh, you know, this is a fantastic direction that I think we need to to uh, uh, to to put more uh, effort in it. Uh, so this kind of uh, uh, it's. You know, what we discover uh, in this process is we often discover, uh, you know, these kind of surprising good models that has surprisingly low uh, re uh, residual area compared to competing models. Exactly. And that was uh, very surprising. And often those kind of models correspond to, you know, good models, uh, the, 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 the good models along the way. So I, I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, opportunities to actually discover, uh, to, to actually explore this direction. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, we, we are in the process of doing that. Uh, and uh, also this connects to, you know, uh, causal reasoning about, you know, whether, you know, the, the, the noise is actually because of, you know, uh, this kind of uh, external uh, noise or whether it's uh, brought by because we fit the wrong model. Uh, so, so there's a lot to do uh, in that domain. Uh, uh, you know what we uh, you know present here is a, a starting point. I, I, I yeah I, I really agree with you that uh, you know there are uh, many uh, things to uh, explore. Um, so uh, 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 no, uh, I think there's another point is that uh, you know if we think about discovering the equations as doing data fitting, uh -huh. I mean we can think of an infinite number of possibilities, yes. right? Yes. So there's a law of parsimony I think in scientific equations, right? You, you tend to use simple things to yes. explain uh, the data, right? Data. So yes. how do we enforce that? Uh, currently, uh, we are not enforcing that, okay? And, uh, and uh, the results are already encouraging, okay? Uh, but I agree with you uh, that what I said, uh, you know, uh, with, with that, uh, with uh, answering to Vipin's uh, question, uh, is sometimes we find very simple equations uh, that fits Surprisingly well, uh, you know, compared to you know a huge pole of other equations, and and typically those we have are right, are correct equations. Uh, so uh, it's very uh, it's a very exciting domain to explore. Uh, so, uh, but for this approach, we didn't do that but, yet. But, but, but is it your vertical approach almost doing it in some sense? Because the vertical approach says. Yes. Go with small number of variables, yes. then yeah. add one more. Variable. Oh, right, yeah. right, right, yeah. right. Yes, yes. You already know yeah. our simple yeah. equation. Yeah. So, so you're saying that already. Yeah. Whereas the upper red line yeah. is working with all the variables. Right. Yeah. And, and who knows what it might professor, be. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, professor, my thinking would be that would depend on what you start with. For some of the starting variables, you could probably reach in two steps, and that would be the simplest equation. Oh, right. But if you yeah, don't yeah. start with that variable, you may have to go to five steps to get a complicated equation. Which, which is why I was which is why I'm asking whether the starting point should be yeah, matters a possible. A yeah. yeah, matters a lot. Our empirical evaluation show that you know you can create you know orders, you know, these equations that has orders of magnitude fitting errors, the difference in the fitting errors. Uh, so uh, it matters a lot of different schedules, different uh, variables to try. Uh, empirical results show that you know it matters a lot. It's just uh, you know currently our approach is that multiple strategy to compete with yeah. each other. Uh, but I agree, there's a lot of things to to explore. Uh, you know, in terms of more knowledge-driven uh, ways for identifying you know the crisis strategy and how this separates with the noise. So are you actually penalizing for larger equations now? Uh, very, uh, you know, it's a good start. Uh, you know, we are fitting equations, uh, you know, let's say 10 independent variables. Okay. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, already a big step uh, compared to uh, previous approaches. The previous approaches, they, uh, you know, for example, you know, most of them use, uh, you know, this AI Feynman data set, uh, that is basically all the equations in the physics uh, textbook of Feynman, Feynman physics. Uh, and uh, those equations are, um, you know, roughly, uh, you know, uh, on the order of like two, 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 three variables, or even like single variable uh, uh, 
uh, equations. Uh, so, so it's already a big step, um, but it's not, you know, at a stage of a hundred variables, a thousand variables. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, you know, our approach, uh, why do we believe we, we can do it? Uh, is because, uh, you know, the initial hypothesis space are way smaller, as uh, Vipin has pointed out, uh, compared to the four hypothesis space, and we believe this can scale up, uh, you know, AI genome scientific discovery, okay? Uh, to prove my point, uh, this is a small human experiment, okay? Uh, so here is a table. Um, you know, uh, the input is x1, x2, x3, okay? The output is y, okay? And I can reassure you that there is an equation that maps the input to the output, okay? Without, with no noise, okay? Uh, so for now, can you tell me an equation that maps x to y? Oh, you're just doing summation, okay. Uh, it's close, yeah, it's yeah. close summation, okay? It's close. Let's see. Um, it's difficult, actually. <laughs> so, so let's do this. Multiply right? the first uh, and second and uh, subtract to the third. Uh, it's very close, but it's still, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, okay. you know, just mess <laughs> up. Yeah. Okay. okay, it's but, fine, yeah. But it's very close, very close. Uh, so uh, how about, uh, you know, I'm showing you only these rows. Can you tell me an equation that maps the, the input to the output? Yeah, multiply the first and second and add to the third. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so for other people, uh, can you tell me an equation that maps the input to the output? Well, if you uh, know the answer, then, uh, you know, uh, this is the equation, okay? So for this restricted case, uh, 2.5 plus 9.5 is 12, okay? 1.8 plus 3.2 is 5, and so on, okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, so how about these rows? Still, multiply first and second act. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's very good, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, so for these rows, uh, you know, initially what we do is, uh, you know, for these rows, you can discover, uh, you know, minus x1 plus x3, okay? So minus three plus four is one, minus 4.2 plus 2.2 is uh, minus two and so on, okay? Uh, and then, uh, you know, we put this together. So the red uh, rows are, you know, x1 plus x3, and then the blue row is minus x1 plus x3, okay? And then uh, we notice that x2 is 1.0 in the red case and minus 1.0 in the blue case, okay? Then, uh, you know, we can actually reason about it. So this is one times x1, and this is minus one times x1, okay? Uh, and uh, it happens to be that x2 is 1.0 and minus 1.0 in the red case and blue case. So possibly, you know, the, uh, the correct equation is x1 times x2 plus x3, okay? And that is indeed the, the correct equation. Uh, you are very quick. <laughs> uh, looking at that table, you can do it. Uh, it's, uh, uh, but still, you, you, you need the first simplification, right? Uh, the, the first, you know, I basically, you know, get rid of and only show you the red ones, right? Uh, so you still see that, uh, you know, uh, what we did uh, in this red and the blue cases are basically this uh, vertical discovery. Uh, it's actually, uh, we control the variable, uh, the control the values of these x2s, okay? In the red row, we control it to be 1.0, and in the blue row, we control it to be minus 1.0, Okay, uh, and uh, this basically, uh, you know, once you control the values of these x2s, uh, you know, you basically can take it out of the picture. Now it's simplify the problem. You actually only need to consider two independent variables, okay? Uh, and because of that, uh, this is why, you know, this simplification leads you to discover these equations faster, okay? Uh, our approach is just basically a implementation of this uh, idea uh, using artificial intelligence, uh, in the first step, what we do uh, is we fit an equation that maps the single input variable to the output, okay? Uh, for this approach, we fix a fixed order, okay? Uh, and we use genetic programming. This is actually not important. You can use other uh, symbolic regression uh, approach. Uh, we fix, uh, use genetic programming to map the single input to the output uh, because there's only one input uh, the fitting usually is easy, uh, and therefore you can, uh, you know, find uh, these equations. Uh, then in the second step, we allow one more variable to vary, 
Uh, and we ask genetic programming to expand uh, the equations find in the, in the first round uh, into any equation that involves these two variables. Okay, uh, and then uh, you know this step gets uh, you know expanded again and again until we find uh, the four equation. Okay, uh, so so that is basically uh, you know our approach. Um, now um, the uh, experimental results show that you know our approach finds uh, you know uh, equations with the smallest uh, regression errors. Uh, compared to a lot of baselines, uh, and this includes uh, you know genetic uh, programming based approaches uh, as well as those approaches that use uh, deep neural nets, deep reinforcement learning, and so on. Um, so uh, we actually uh, you know apply this approach uh, for uh, you know learning partial differential equations uh, from experimental data. Uh, so for that, uh, we look at uh, you know modeling nanostructure evolutions. Uh, in materials under extreme conditions. Uh, what I mean extreme condition is extreme heat, uh, hundreds or thousands of degrees uh, Celsius, uh, and irradiation, okay? So under this uh, uh, you know, uh, extreme condition, uh, so if you look at these nanostructures, so if you look at uh, you know, these uh, nanovoids, uh, in this case, uh, they actually change in their shape. So uh, they change in their shape and move. Uh, so they are jiggling around. So if you track of these the small nanovoids, so this is in electric microscope. So this is very small. This is 200 nanometers. Uh, so this is roughly like, uh, you know, five nanometers or so. Uh, so these uh, nanovoids, they're jiggling around uh, in this environment. And we would like to use a set of partial differential equations to describe their movement. Uh, so uh, we develop this, uh, you know, integrated approach that integrates computer vision, uh, with this uh, neural differential equation uh, network uh, that can simultaneously track uh, the involvement of these nanovoids, uh, but at the same time learn a set of partial differential equations. Uh, so uh, this is a demonstration. Uh, this is the original video. Uh, we can offer uh, close to 100%. Uh, uh, so we can offer close to 100% accurate in tracking, uh, but also at the same time, uh, learn a set of uh, the values of a set of partial differential uh, equations uh, that describe the uh, the spatial and temporal involvement uh, of these nanovoids. Um, now, uh, this is the simulated results of the model learned. So you see that it's basically uh, you know uh, uh, replicates uh, the original video. Uh, but uh, if you use uh, the uh, uh, the neural networks, uh, so if you um, you know, use the neural networks to uh, predict what is going to happen. Uh, it quickly gives you uh, physically impossible results. Um, a question is, can this symbolic, uh, you know, vertical discovery actually uh, scale up also the learning uh, of, uh, you know, these partial differential equations? Uh, for that, we consider this uh, model that uh, models these benthic solidification. So this is the form of a snowflake, okay? Uh, this is even more difficult than the null voids. Um, and uh, it's described by this, uh, you know, rather complicated uh, partial differential equation. Uh, we learn the values of this partial differential equation. So it's, uh, the form is given, okay? And we only learn the values. Uh, we split the, the parameters into the blue group and the red group. Uh, and we design this vertical learning experiment uh, that first we, we only feed the model, the, the learning algorithm, uh, with this data in which the, the blue parameters, they don't have any effect on the spatial and temporal dynamics uh, of the, of this, uh, on this data. Uh, so this allows the model to focus learning the red parameters. And then in the second step, we allow the models to learn both the red and the blue parameters, okay? Uh, so, um, so in this case, so this is the original, uh, uh, you know, uh, ground truth model. So if you learn all the parameters at once, uh, you basically have this kind of a model. Uh, uh, you know, it's basically learned the therapeutic solidification. Uh, uh, you know, but but with the wrong number of petals. Uh, so it's a different kind of snowflake. Okay, uh, but uh, if you follow the uh, the vertical learning experiments, uh, you are basically. Uh, going to uh, you know discover the ground truth model. So uh, uh, it's the uh, the snowflake, the exact snowflake uh, that you see from the ground truth model. But but for this, you had to tell the system which are the the ones yes. that are changing. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. 
So, so uh, this is a vertical way to use the vertical approach yeah, yeah. without that information. The currently, uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, has a lot of critics, uh, human insights in it. built into it. Right? Uh, it's basically, you know, we, we, uh, we, we look at the model and we see the model actually naturally decompose this. Uh, and therefore, uh, we first ignore, so basically, like hold these variables as constants and focus learning on the red parameters. Uh, and then in the second step, allow the both models. Um, but uh, yeah, it uh, has a lot of human insights uh, in, in the, in the, at the moment. I guess uh, it gives you a framework to improper human yeah, insights. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it will be great. Uh, yeah, the incorporating physics insights is good. Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah, many yeah, people yeah. look at it this yeah. way. You know, in a yeah, part yeah. Of it's way. actually good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you said uh, you're holding it constant, right? Would it matter what constant you hold it at? It, in this case, it doesn't matter. So uh, in this case, uh, in the first step, the experimental data will fit into the model. Uh, uh, no matter which value these blue parameters are, they have exactly the same dynamics. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so at the moment, so they okay. don't. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, you can design other kind of experiments and fit it with other kind of data that maybe this has effects. Okay. Um, so. Uh, you know, what I said, uh, you know, we, we showed this vertical symbolic regression task, uh, and this is the idea of building this incrementally more and more complex models. Uh, and we show that this expedites learning PDEs from experimental data. Uh, and to look into the future, I really think, uh, this is what I really want to communicate, uh, is uh, in the past, uh, you know, this uh, symbolic regression has been a pure learning task. This is really because you know, the input is more, uh, data, the output is model. Although the model is a mathematical equation, but still there are models. Uh, so because of that, uh, most of the work, 98% uh, of the work, uh, follow this uh, classical machine learning pipeline, okay? Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, what we show here is another possibility uh, that we don't have to discover the uh, ground truth model upfront, okay? So learning this uh, full model in the full hypothesis space upfront. Instead, we can decide, you know, what are these reduced hypothesis space? And what are these, uh, you know, uh, controlled variable experiments uh, that can, you know, help us uh, in finding the, the, the final model, okay? Uh, and this, uh, I believe we can use automated reasoning uh, to actually decide, you know, what kind of data we are collecting and what kind of hypothesis we are forming and so on. This will, uh, you know, complete this feedback loop, and in this case, uh, even expedite uh, scientific discovery even more. Okay, so so this is uh, basically the high level idea uh, that we. So, so how, how does this work uh, relate to or distinguishes from what Nathan Kutz and Steve Brenton's group is doing in Washington? Uh, so uh, I think say what they do. They don't have the reasoning, but they just have data model. I mean, is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do they do? Uh, they have uh, this uh, uh, thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so the CMB is basically a sparse uh, regression task that, uh, you know, they basically formulate this as a, a sparse identification. Uh, so I think uh, we are from a different angle uh, that, uh, you know, I believe that, you know, they, they are building a, a you know, a, the full model upfront. Okay. And uh, I believe that. So uh, that's because this is a horizontal approach. Yeah, 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 yeah. They they are also uh, you know building these uh, models upfront, uh, so so learning the the full model. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, you know our approach, uh, this incremental approach, can uh, you know uh, expedite their approach as well. Uh, now, of course, they have recent uh, you know work that actually uh, builds this integrated uh, wet lab uh, that uh, integrates uh, you know data collection uh, and uh, you know hypothesis forming and uh, you know experiments. Uh, with uh, with this uh, AI that I think is one of their recent work. Uh, I think that uh, is closer to, 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 to our work. I see. Um, yeah, but, uh, but it's still in terms of, you know, it's a little bit uh, different. But uh, to put it in this way, I believe, you know, this approach can also uh, scale up singly. Because it's orthogonal. You know, yeah, it's also Yeah, it's, it's another dimension. It's a vertical approach, so you can always yes. apply it to, yes. to the yes. yes. But wouldn't Cindy be closer to the red thing at this point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it's close to the red thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, my point may not be totally relevant, but you know, this triggered me to start to think about the way we're training our networks. I mean, 
we train very large neural networks and then we burn GPUs, right? We burn yeah. money. And then people start to say, we need to deploy small models. So let's do knowledge distillation, let's do quantization, let's do compression, right? Yeah. Can we do, you know, neural network actually in this way? You know, if we can do it in this way, that's much more efficient. Yes, right? yes. I, 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 uh, it is uh, something that's, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's worth exploring. Okay. Uh, how to do it, I'm not completely sure, uh, but but definitely if we can have a series of neural models, right? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's, uh, you know, it's actually the first stage of the neural model predicts a uh, course, uh, you know, this uh, uh, dynamics in the course level. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, it gets refined by, you know, later stage unit models. Uh, it's going to be very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know how to do it. Okay, uh, it's something if we can do, uh, that's, that's will be great. Yeah, that will save a lot of GPUs. Yes, <laughs> yeah. and then that's one of the, yeah, the pain points. Right? Uh, um, one more so in your uh, vertical approach, I guess at some point, your model decided not to include any more, uh, to include more uh, variables. Mm -hmm. uh, but how do you know whether this is come from the noise or, come from like you are not including sufficiently enough variable. So for example, yeah, if we consider Newton's and Einstein's yes. gravity equation, yeah. so Einstein's help us side, okay, there's a very small term yeah. you see in the equation, yeah. but you don't know whether this is because of noise make your model stop yeah. or not enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very, very good question. Uh, uh, so the starting point uh, of, uh, you know, I, I do this, okay, I started to work on this is if you really look at what Einstein did, okay, it's really solving a nuance, if you think about it, uh, is, you know, Newton's model works great 99.9% .9 of the time. It's only in that very, very extreme long tail scenario, it start to break, right? Uh, and uh, you know, if you use the, the standards, machine learning perspective, uh, that should not be anything to worry about. Uh, because you think about it, uh, it works very well in 99.99% .99 of the time. Uh, so, so it's not anything to worry about. And Einstein said, uh, let's don't be satisfied with that. That is actually not because of the noise, uh, it is actually because of a deeper fundamental thing that result is that you know the model doesn't did not predict very well uh, in this super high speed and uh, you know in super high uh, you know mass right this situation yeah. um, and and that takes a quite a lot of belief in it right uh, uh, you know you you have to believe in this <laughs> this uh, this thing to to actually reason about it um, and. If you think about the current machine learning paradigm, uh, uh, this is one thing that you know you, you need to think about. You know whether the current machine learning paradigm will be able to get us a new Einstein. Uh, you know, the the trend is, you know, we are doing very great <laughs> in ninety nine point nine nine percent of the time, and the rest is noise, right? Uh, so the starting point of this approach, uh, we thought about it is and we really want to say you know can we build these active scientists that are not satisfied uh by this uh you know the the, the common uh you know if great feeling right uh, and with a minusk uh change in the in the noise uh and can we really do a, a einstein build an einstein uh, you know using ai that that was the starting point now of course, if you're asking me whether I can do it with the current model, uh, the answer is no. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, you know, this is what we have been thinking. Uh, and we hope, uh, you know, uh, we can build something that is different from this idea of larger models, uh, bigger data, uh, and, uh, you know, discover everything. Yeah, and do you think, for example, uh, probably to me, I believe horizontal path is a better way if we want to discover like something I understand it because it first includes all the variable, so we don't have to worry yeah, about starting point. Yeah, based on right? yeah. in this case. Yeah. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, 
horizontal model uh -huh. at the beginning, it uh -huh. includes all the possible variables. Yeah. So we all we do need to do is to narrow it down instead of be some single bottom it's up. It's difficult, yes. So, uh, but but at least it's optimality one. perspective, I think that should give you the most optimal solution. Uh, right? So our empirical result, uh, our empirical evidence show that uh, if you uh, impose uh, these kind of models with all the independent variables and ask the model to learn a, a, an equation in the full hypothesis space, uh, you know, uh, it starts with most of these models. Uh, they, uh, they were not developed in this multivariable situation, okay? They were developed to specialize for, you know, the equations in Feynman data, uh, Feynman textbook. Uh, and what we discovered is most of these models, when they, if you learn it from this uh, very high dimensional space or with a lot of variables, usually what they return is a, very simple equation because they don't, they actually feel so confused about all these variables and then they cannot discover anything. And then they return, uh, you know, either a linear equation with only one variable or is a constant. They, they just believe, you know, the best affinity equation is a constant equation, <laughs> okay? So that's usually what happens. Um, so I really believe is, uh, you know, the complexity that is brought by, you know, all these interacting uh, uh, variables and processes, uh, they make the problem very complex. Uh, and so the existing approaches, uh, if you start by doing that, you actually don't have the chance to refine the model. What you will get most of the time are very simple models. Uh, that are, you know, it's, you know, it's a, like a constant model or something that has, huge, uh, you know, uh, regression errors. Uh, so, um, yeah, so so that's the current situation. So, uh, so, 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 so there the, the are multiple uh, dimensions here. One is yeah. how many variables, yeah. right? and you're reducing them yeah. as you go vertically. Yeah. Uh, second thing I'm sure is the sample size, because if you yes. have lots of sample versus fewer yeah. samples, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. The third thing is the amount of noise. Right. If there's no noise, yeah. one situation, yeah. if you have lots of noise, yeah. the other yeah. situation. Yeah. So how do these things trade up? Suppose uh, I have, uh, uh, is there a situation in some context in which you would sort of say the vertical approach is significantly better than the horizontal approach and vice versa, given these three spaces, right? Lots of variables. Yeah, yeah. Small I, I variables, really, lots of variables, yeah. small noise, a lot of noise. Yes. And, 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 and small number of data point to yeah. a lot of data. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, uh, so our empirical uh, results show that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the data size, uh, the, the noise plays a vital role. Okay. So, so, so uh, uh, you know, if you increase, even turn up the noise a little bit, uh, it will, uh, you know, choke most of the approaches, including the approaches that, that we uh, developed. Yeah, but which one talks first? Between horizontal uh, and horizontal ones. Yeah. 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 And that sort of makes sense. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 that makes sense. It, yeah. it's looking at uh, that's the space. most of the vital thing. Uh, the data set size uh, is sort of like, you know, as long as you are in a reasonable region, uh, you're okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I agree with you that, uh, you know, this needs more systematic study of the three factors. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but your definition of data being in a reasonable region will also depend on your hypothesis sequence yes. starting, right? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so what I'm saying is really, you know, uh, uh, you know, tens of thousands of data points, something like that. Um, but it's a very rough okay. range. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but so I agree with you that we need more study uh, in this uh, detailed study in this paper. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, finally, uh, you know, we have uh, 50 minutes. I'm going to talk about the third topic. Uh, it's also very exciting. Uh, and this topic is uh, we are using reasoning to solve this satisfiability module counting problem uh, that integrates symbolic and statistical AI with promo guarantees. Uh, so for that, I'm going to use my, the, the actually, uh, you know, the, the process that we discovered this, uh, uh, this process, okay? Uh, so in 2020, we actually discovered that automatic reasoning enables learning with proper guarantees. Uh, we work on the Markov random field model. Uh, this is, uh, if you don't know about it, you should. Uh, this is one of the highly influential model uh, in uh, machine learning uh, and uh, with many applications in computer vision, natural language processing, and so on and so forth. If you look at the original paper, this is the conditional random field paper. It received 18,000 citations. So this is one of the most influential models in machine learning, okay? 
Uh, however, the, uh, the probabilistic inference and learning of this model is intractable. Uh, in fact, it is highly intractable. It is beyond the MP complete, okay? So this is basically the, the task of finding the uh, maximum likelihood estimation, the MLE uh, for Markov random fields. Uh, you see that it actually contains this, uh, 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 the computation of the partition function. Uh, this is basically the sum of an exponential many terms uh, in this model. And this makes this, uh, you know, the learning part. So this is uh, actually getting the MLE, the maximum likelihood estimation for Markov random fields, uh, highly intractable. In fact, it's beyond uh, the NP completeness, okay? Uh, so what we discovered in 2021 uh, was that we find an algorithm that converged in linear speed uh, towards the true MLE, the true maximum likelihood estimation, uh, in linear speed. Now, there is a big asteroid there. Uh, it's not saying that uh, we, did, we find a algorithm that has linear, that's runs in linear time to find the MLE, okay? Uh, it's a stochastic gradient descent based algorithm, but in each stochastic gradient descent step, we actually need to solve uh, MP complete problems. So, this is a, a approach that reduced the problem from highly intractable, meaning uh, you know, sharp P, right? sharp P hard, uh, into an MP complete problem. So, so it's reduced the problem from highly intractable to an intractable problem, okay? Uh, but at the same time, we are able to reason about how far away we are from the true uh, maximum likelihood estimations. Uh, this is the first time ever anybody can do this, okay? Uh, now, uh, similarly, uh, we look into this stochastic optimization problem, uh, these are problems with a lot of applications in operational research, econometrics, robotics, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are the problems that finds, uh, you know, uh, policy interventions that maximize or minimize uh, the expectation of a stochastic function. Uh, and these kind of problems are also, you see that it also has this intractable model counting uh, embedded in the problem, and therefore it's also highly intractable. Uh, we find the first algorithm has linear convergence rate uh, towards the global optimal. Uh, and we also look at these games. So this is in game theory. Uh, we look at these uh, leader follower games in which you have a leader uh, that commits strategy before the followers. Uh, these are the so-called Stuckelberg games. It has a lot of applications uh, in computational sustainability, AI for social impact, and so on. Uh, we uh, specifically look at these quantum response games in which the leader and the followers, they both act probabilistically, uh, and they have exponential large action spaces. Uh, we again uh, find these algorithms with linear convergence speed uh, towards the true Stuckelberg equivalent. So we can solve this game up to optimal uh, uh, using our approaches. Uh, and that has never happened before. Uh, so uh, after these many successes, we ask ourselves, uh, you know, why we are you know, finding this, uh, you know, discovering these uh, uh, breakthroughs again and again. Uh, what do all these problems have in common? Uh, now, these, all these problems are integrations of symbolic and statistical AI. Uh, basically, uh, you know, these kind of problems are, imagine if you have a set solver that can reason about probabilities, then you can solve all these problems, okay? Uh, so, uh, so what, because of that, uh, we, uh, you know, come up with this uh, new logic language, it's called satisfiability module counting. Uh, that basically adds uh, to the standard satisfiability a new module theory, and the module theory is about probabilistic inference. Okay, so uh, so SMC uh, this kind of uh, uh, language besides the truth of Boolean formula uh, that involves uh, these predicates whose uh, truth values are determined by model counting by uh, you know uh, uh, by uh, uh, probabilistic inference. Okay. Um, but is the symbolic, does it know, need to know the binary or can it work with fractions? Uh, so you can do fractions, right. yes. Uh, but that will lead to larger models, okay? okay? Uh, but for now you're assuming binary. Uh, yeah, for now we are assuming binary, okay? So uh, what does a satisfiability module counting problem look like? Uh, so here is an example, find me a hotel, so my expected working time to travel AI and to either one of the two cafes are within 30 minutes. So what you do is you have these expectations, 
uh, but then you need to connect the expectations with this, uh, you know, NNOs, okay? Uh, now, uh, uh, then you need to write these expectations as uh, this uh, model counting problem that, uh, you know, you need to actually reason about the, uh, you know, the, uh, the random variables, okay? Uh, and uh, this leads to this uh, sum of the exponential large sum that has the exponential large uh, number of parameters. Uh, then, uh, you know, you can run it in this way, and then if you use uh, the, uh, the Boolean variables to represent whether is each of these uh, model counting is satisfied, uh, then this basically gives you this kind of a problem that uh, it has a Boolean formula, just like set, okay? But then the values of a, a few Boolean variables are determined by model counting, okay? So it has this symbolic part, also has a statistical part, okay? So this is what we mean by this SMC problem uh, that it basically has this Boolean formula, uh, but then uh, you know the, the values of a few Boolean formulas are uh, Boolean variables are determined by model count. Okay. Uh, so uh, for our paper, we work on this uh, slightly relaxed problem that we replace this one uh, bidirectional implication with one directional implication. Okay. Uh, but our approach is very exciting. The approach. First, in the first part, it reduces this SMC problem that has model counting embedded in it into a set problem. Okay? And then we use a standard set solver to solve the problem. If the set solver says it's satisfiable, we return satisfiable. If it says not satisfiable, we, we return not satisfiable. Okay? Uh, we can show a constant information bound uh, for this problem. Uh, the constant information bound stays in this way. So if the original problem is satisfiable, if you tighten the model counting by a multiplicative constant, the SMC problem is satisfiable if you tighten this bound by a two to the C, okay? Then our approach will find the satisfiable solution with high probability, okay? If the original problem is not satisfiable, even if you relax the bound by a multiplicative constant, then our approach will also deny that the problem is satisfiable. Okay, it will also say the problem is not satisfiable with high probability. Okay, now why can we do that? Uh, it's because of an exciting connection uh, between model counting and uh, solving set problems. Uh, uh, you know, uh, subject to XOR constraints. So for that, uh, we are really considering you know unweighted uh, model counting problem that is. Uh, uh, you know, counting the number of solutions to a Boolean form. Okay. Uh, now, uh, uh, the weighted model counting, probabilistic inference is weighted model counting, but there is this transformation that is, you know, we don't want to discuss this uh, for this talk. Uh, but for this Boolean formula, it has these two models, okay, these two solutions. What makes it exciting is if you write all the constraints, all the XOR constraints, that it involves X1 and X2. So an XOR constraint, so X1, XOR, X2 is true if and only if uh, one of the variable is true, okay? Uh, so the exciting thing about it is you can look at whether this uh, model, each of these models satisfy this XOR constraint or not. Uh, one means it's satisfied, zero means it doesn't, okay? Uh, what you see is each of these models satisfies exactly half of the XOR constraints. So 50% of these rows is one, columns is one, 50% is zero, okay? Now why does that, is that an interesting fact is because if you consider this uh, formula that connects the original F of X with this randomly uh, sample of XOR constraints from this set, okay, uniformly at random, uh, then the number of models, the number of solutions that satisfy this is half of the number of solutions that satisfy this, okay, the, the original F, okay? Uh, so because of that, we can do a very interesting redu reduction. So if we want to know whether there are more than two to the three solutions to this fat set formula, uh, so here I'm using the red dots to mean there is a solution, okay? And we want to know if there are more than two to the three red dots, okay? Uh, what I can do is I can start adding uh, to this formula XOR constraints, randomized uh, sample XOR constraints. And I know any one XOR constraint 
I'm basically getting rid of half of the reference. Okay? I can keep doing it for a second time and a third time. Okay? Uh, and uh, uh, basically, if there is more than two to the three models, you add uh, three XO constraints, highly likely, uh, you know, you're still uh, left with at least the one red points. Okay? Now, if uh, you know you have uh, fewer than two to the three points, uh, red points. You add a three x all constraint, highly likely you are left with no red points. Okay. Now, why is that a good good uh, good observation? It's because the SMC formula has this implicit model counting embedded in it. You actually it's beyond MP, and you don't know how to solve it. Uh, so uh, if you use uh, uh, you know this uh, x all constraint. You can reduce this problem into a formula that uh, that's this only. It's a pure Boolean formula, okay? So you can use a standard self solver uh, to solve these problems and we get a uh, constant ratio guarantee, okay? Uh, experimental results uh, show that our approach outperforms uh, baselines, uh, but also it outperforms the baselines, uh, uh, you know, in terms of time, and this is very encouraging. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, these approaches, they are local search-based approaches. Uh, we need to solve MP-complete problems using set solvers, but still we are faster than them. And this is really because there's, uh, you know, a very rapid development in set solving uh, in the last few decades. Uh, so this is additional application. You see it also leads both in solution quality and time. Uh, so to conclude, uh, so I talked about uh, you know vertical reasoning, enhanced neural generation, uh, uh, driven scientific discovery, and uh, solving satisfiability module counting problems uh, with guarantees. What I really like to talk about is reasoning and learning. If they are combined, they can multiply their own power. Okay, they can be even more powerful. Uh, and there has been a good uh, critique about large language models last year, uh, saying that large language models cannot reason. Um, since then, there are uh, you know these uh, uh, these ideas that interface large language models with uh, coding, with uh, you know uh, uh, with web interface and so on. And I think this is trying to build reasoning capabilities for large language models. And I think these are good starts. Uh, what I uh, think is deep integration uh, uh, of learning and reasoning offers way more. Uh, so you have seen three uh, uh, cases. Uh, that reasoning generates design, satisfying uh, user specifications, X files learning, and solves SMC with approval guarantees. Uh, so uh, it's, I'm very fortunate to work in this intersection of learning and reasoning, uh, and uh, it has been very exciting so far. Uh, and I believe uh, with the introduction of large language models and this new uh, uh, you know, uh, computing paradigm, uh, I think this uh, uh, topic will be uh, even more important uh, in the future. Uh, and certainly I look forward uh, you know, uh, to uh, make contributions in this domain uh, in the next, uh, in the years ahead. Uh, so with that, um, this is the end of my talk and uh, thank you very much. Questions? There's a single question. Any more questions? So for the third part um, that you just talked about, uh, can you point to some applications where you sort of put, put your fingers on that, that it really works? I mean, it's just, it's, you know, the, the third so, part, right? You know, this, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so it really uh, depends on uh, so uh, there are a lot of applications that we, we showed. So for example, uh, you know, we showed uh, learning, uh, uh, you know, Markov Binding Fields. Uh, this is basically uh, proof of learning, okay? We can show that we really discovered the, the, the best model, okay? Mm -hmm. the, the, the model that's empirically, that's not empirically, theoretically, it's the maximum likelihood estimation mm -hmm. for Markov Binding Fields. Uh, now that has a lot of implications. For example, uh, you know, in uh, in virtual reinforcement learning, this is the task of uh, you know you want to discover the reward uh, by looking at the, the behavior. This is another very important application uh, in uh, you know uh, in the uh, in, in reinforcement learning domain. Uh, we can uh, you know uh, you know discover this reward function. We can actually question you know reason about how far away we are from the ground truth reward function. Okay, 
uh, and in terms of uh, stochastic grain uh, stochastic optimization, uh, these are the problems. So, for example, in energy, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in energy uh, applications, uh, you know, we want to find these policies uh, that can, you know, at least give us, uh, you know, uh, assurances. Uh, these, uh, uh, you know, uh, confidence assurances that you know there are reliable energy supplies, um, uh, or in, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, disaster preparations. Uh, these are the, uh, you know, uh, we we want to find these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, city plan, city plan that can ensure that in when this earthquake uh, happens, uh, you know, uh, uh, if it is one out of a thousand years, this kind of earthquake, we still have safe uh, eva evacuation plans. Uh, we want to have these kind of guarantees, okay? Uh, and all these kind of uh, approaches, uh, previous methods, uh, most of them, uh, they are based on optimization. So they find a plan, okay? And they can tell you that empirically this plan works uh, better than uh, you know empirically I tested you know for the cases the test cases that I consider uh, it's it works better uh, than uh, you know the uh, the other approaches uh, we can demonstrate we can show we can give you this kind of uh, bond uh, that tells that if uh, you know this is one out of a thousand year uh, you know earthquake we can guarantee you that uh, the people can, you know, safely eva evacuate, okay? So, so we have these holistic guarantees, um, which, uh, you know, in today's machine learning, you know, <laughs> you know we have these people that, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they really uh, are, are, are so much into the, you know, good empirical results. Uh, but if you are in this uh, safety critical regions, okay, uh, that you need a reliable, uh, you know, policy interventions uh, with uh, approval guarantees uh, and so on, that uh, uh, these are the applications that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think our approach are basically the only one that's right now can be used. Okay. So I was thinking from your probably probable guarantee perspective, you're saying if it's once in a thousand uh, year earthquake, you said, uh, if I'm not remembering it wrong, you can say for a fact that it's highly probabilistic that that'll happen, yeah. but that not that's not necessarily the case for one in a thousand years. So so way. so so we can prove this kind of bond. Okay, the bond we can prove. The bond we can prove uh, is uh, this happens with very high probability. Okay, uh, so we the bond we can prove is uh, this thing. We will discover a, a, a solution. In which uh, you know it satisfies these kind of uh, guarantees, okay, uh, with very high probability, okay. You can formulate the problem uh, negatively. You can you can use uh, negations to formulate the problem. You can say, you know, can I find a policy intervention uh, that uh, only breaks, okay, in uh, you know one out of a thousand years, okay. So so you can use these negations in the formulations, okay. And then you use a very small uh, probability on here, okay? Uh, and then you can say, oh, you know, I want to be super safe, okay? So you can bump up the, you know, this, this uh, guarantee, okay? You can say that, oh, you know, in the very worst case, one out of a thousand years, uh, you know, these will break uh, this uh, threshold, but the threshold is a, uh, you know, it's already, I'm a, already you know, I'm, I'm already, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, on the safe yeah. side. Okay. That's what I was thinking. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so that's basically, uh, you know, uh, what you can do. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. More questions? All right. But uh, just, just, just one, one last question. And of course, for, for many of you in the audience, you won't remember it. But 30, 40 years ago, the biggest debate in the AI was declarative versus procedural. Uh, you know, uh, and. And declarative is the one that sort of let you know, would refer to the logical yes. statements of fact, which is sort of what you're getting over, right? Yeah. You know, you, you can use the first order logic yeah. or, or dis descendants. Um, and procedural, of course, is is sort of uh, very different. You you have an, a procedure executing to get a job done or, or a rule yeah. getting done, and, and uh, the the machine learning the, or the kind that we do today 
was sort of not on the radar screen of, of the people back 40 years ago. Yeah. So you are combining the the logic part yeah, the with, mach with the machine learning yeah, part, right? You know, that, that's, that's what you're yes, trying yes, to do yes, in, yes. in, in the Try to bridge the, the two. Uh, the, the two paradigms, right? Yeah, yeah. The two, two very different paradigms. And, and, and doing them in a synergistic way as opposed to just yeah. pasting them together. Right. Very interesting. All right. Very good. Well, let's thank the yeah, speaker. Thank, oh, yeah, thank, thank you. you. So for the lunch, I'm going to take it. Uh, you check the number. Oh, you have the number? I think it's okay. Uh, yeah. I think Wait, it's, okay, so uh, okay. I think if you remember the number, 6776. Six. Simon, did you watch all those three videos? Uh, I watched the first one. Yes, yes I, I haven't yeah, watched it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really long. It's the first one, three hours. Yes, okay, let me charge to make it. <laughs> we can do that. But, you know, just six, oh, seven, 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 six, seven, 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 eight, seven, seven, eight, Six, yeah, yeah, same. So I, uh, I finished only that. one, I have five more. Oh, I haven't finished that. Yeah. Six, seven, 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 Think Both so. weeks have just gone into reviews. <laughs> Review papers? Yeah, last week five papers, ICML, this week six right. papers, KDD. Any of you want to join in our dinner yeah. for lunch? Right. Uh, thank you very much. Wow, well, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for hosting. I'm okay. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. So long to start. Enjoy the meeting? Yeah, this meeting. This meeting. All right. Yeah, how you feel to come is fine. You know? uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Bye.